Visions of the American West. Today, we're going to be talking about some uh, painters and photographers who helped shape uh, our vision of how we perceive uh, the, the American West, uh, starting, well, ironically enough, the um, our first it paintings, uh, the beginning of what would be the mythology of the Wild West, really starts on the East Coast. So I'm going to be going into that at the beginning of the talk. And then we're going to go right through until the 1960s, when um, there's a, uh, a group of Native American artists working out of New Mexico, which will really change uh, the way we see Western, the, 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 uh, the, the visual vocabulary for, for, for Western painting. Uh, it's a real game changer in the 1960s. So I'm going to talk about that. And right up, right up to today, uh, there's a lot of exciting stuff going on uh, with painters, photographers, uh, two of my favorites uh, are Princess Wendy Redstar and also uh, Jeanette Quick to See Smith. And I'm going to talk about them later on in the talk. Um, and I'll just note quickly uh, for those of you who are interested, enjoy the talk. Uh, the, the show with uh, Jeanette Quick to See Smith is currently at the Whitney, and it's only up for about three more weeks. So, anyone who's interested in this subject matter, I would strongly uh, suggest you, if you can get into the city and see the show, it's a very popular show. And uh, uh, this is the first show of a, a Native American artist ever at, at the Whitney. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. This, this, this image right here that we're starting with is uh, a collage, a photo collage done by Princess Wendy Red Star. Uh, it's called Her Dreams Are True. And as I said, I'm going to talk about her work later on in the talk. But I want to start here. And as I said, oddly enough, what we think of as the, the, uh, the mythology of the American West in painting, really, it didn't start in the, in the West. It actually started on the East Coast with the Hudson River School. Uh, this is a painting by Thomas Cole who was the father of the Hudson River School. And um, this was done uh, in the uh, like 18, uh, let's say this is like 18, I think this painting was done in 1842. Uh, and with these paintings, these new, a new genre of landscape painting is born in America. Uh, Cole is combining these uh, kind of, uh, uh, how can I say, very um, grand scale. These paintings are, are really large scale paintings. And he's creating a, a vision of the Hudson River Valley as a kind of Eden, a new Eden, uh, with, with divine intervention uh, that, you know, this is God's country. And uh, this was a very, very popular genre. And Cole became very famous and, and very successful. And it started the Hudson River School. And um, yeah, so uh, we'll see. So it starts here, but then by second generation Hudson River School painters, we have um, a, a second generation. This painting is done by Albert Bierstadt. And around the 1860s, the some of the members of the Hudson River School start to venture westward and uh, start to use the same style of these kind of like almost pseudo-religious uh, grand landscapes and try to create uh, imagery for, from the West. So this painting by uh, Bierstadt was done in the Rocky Mountains and it was called, at Lander's uh, Peak. And uh, I, I know this is hard to see on the small screen, but if you look at the foreground in this painting, uh, in this painting, Bierstadt includes, along with the horses and dogs, um, indigenous people. And I say that intentionally, not uh, because um, Native Americans are very critical of these paintings, and uh, they feel they were portrayed uh, almost as uh, 
objects along with the animal life and the, the, the images that these painters were doing at the time, uh, Native Amer a lot of Native American artists now uh, would challenge and say this was really not the reality at all that was going on. It was not this untouched Eden, but um, in fact, for this assignment, Bierstadt was actually sent west by a surveying company. Uh, and they really were trying to, to really create a, a language to uh, promote their own um, uh, ends to develop these lands. But um, one more of these paintings by Bierstadt, again, of the Rocky Mountains, and you can see this very moody, uh, Eden-like quality to these paintings. Um, and uh, this is these paintings, by the way, are still enormously popular in America, and many Americans still see them as like the the uh, you know the golden age of uh, American painting, and their influences is still felt. So, in addition to these um, Hudson River School paintings, which were, who were starting to make these trips out west, come back to the east to their studios and create these new narratives. Um, there was another source for our perceptions of the Wild West, so to speak, at the time, and that was uh, magazines, uh, including these early dime novels. Uh, this, this, this publication, Buffalo Bill Stories, again, I ironically was not uh, published in the West, but it was published uh, you know, here in New York. And any stories, any, you know, uh, this narrative of the, the Wild West and the wars with the, uh, you use this in the vernacular, uh, Indians and cowboys uh, was, were hugely popular here. So here we're getting this, this other part of the popular narrative uh, on the Wild West and Native Americans uh, via popular culture. And usually the, of course, the uh, the white man was, was portrayed as the heroic conqueror and the Native Americans were the kind of noble savages. Um, and this was the beginning of the golden age of magazines, you know, advances in printing techniques and the railroads that were being built were uh, really increasing circulations for magazines and they were hugely popular. So the, the, the artist that was, I'd say the most responsible for this mythos of the lone cowboy, the noble cowboy, uh, was Frederick Remington. And this is one of his early paintings done for Harper's Weekly. And uh, Remington, uh, now Cole was in the fine arts world, hugely successful. Well, Remington was the most successful and popular uh, artist, illustrator, painter uh, in, 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 the, in the world of magazines and popular culture. And more than any other artist from this period, he created this new narrative again of this, this noble cowboy. Um, now I wanna just talk about one other artist from this period who had a, a, a very diff different sensibility about uh, what he wanted to paint, uh, focusing on the, on the West. And uh, his name was George Catlin. And, uh, George Catlin, uh, from about 1830 to about 1836, uh, made it his mission to paint portraits of uh, American uh, Native Americans. Uh, Catlin was was born and raised in, in Pennsylvania. His father was an attorney. Catlin uh, did go to law school. He, he tried practicing law, decided it wasn't for him, and he studied art in Philadelphia for a period and then started to uh, make trips further and further west, uh, again, on this mission to create this body of work, a historical record of customs of uh, Native Americans by, by doing primarily their, their portraits. Now, keep in mind, this was the period just before um, people like Matthew Brady and when, when the new medium of photography, uh, portraiture photography, would start to uh, be the primary uh, uh, way of making portraits. 
Um, so he, so Catlin was in this small window just before photography would completely dominate this, this uh, genre. But you can see from this portrait uh, that he had a much more sensitive, sensitive approach to Native Americans. And he really, uh, this more humanistic uh, view into their, into their culture, uh, including their details of their clothing, their jewelry, the, the face painting, uh, everything was recorded. And um, Catlin had hoped that he would be able to sell uh, his whole body of work eventually to the federal government as a historical record. He eventually did about, I, I think, somewhere around 600 paintings. Uh, now, what happened is, this is another one of these portraits. Um, these, these paintings were shown in galleries in New York and on the East Coast. And unfortunately for uh, Catlin, they didn't prove to be very popular. The shows got very low attendance. They weren't really well received. And it would, you know, it's fair to say that people were probably uh, bored by these paintings. It was too much for them to, to think of Native Americans in this humanistic way as, as equals or as human beings, as opposed to the popular culture uh, uh, portrayal of Native Americans. So because of this fact, he, he was not able to sell his work to the federal government. This is one more Catlin painting I'll share with you today. Again, this is a beautiful piece, and it's showing uh, Native American uh, men, braves, uh, with, in one of their sports. Uh, one tribe had this sport they played with balls. Um, and uh, so what happened is the federal government did not buy his work. He, uh, he managed to, to finance himself to get to Europe. And his paintings were much more popular in Europe. He came back and he was able to sell his entire body of work, like 600 paintings, to an American industrialist. I think his name was uh, James Harrington. And um, he was disappointed, of course, because now it was in private hands and would never be shown and was not, never, it was not part of an official uh, historical record. But uh, he, and then he, so out of frustration, he began to create a whole second body of work using tracings from his first paintings and studies from his first paintings, which weren't nearly as good. He didn't do as well with those. And um, he had a wife and daughter to support and he struggled. Fortunately for him, uh, Harrington's widow uh, donates his original body of work like 600 paintings to the Smithsonian Institute, which, which, which is where they are today and uh, available for uh, the public to see, uh, if not in person, online, uh, but they are at the Smithsonian. Uh, Catlin himself uh, really had a rough time towards the end of his life and actually wound up uh, dying in um, Jersey City, New Jersey. So one more, I just want to close this little segment on Catlin out with this um, photograph, which I was able to get from the Kennedy Library in Boston, their archives. And this is a photograph of a, of a door to a private chamber, which Jackie Kennedy used as her kind of private space when she wanted to get away from everything. And uh, I find this very interesting. I do another talk on Jackie Kennedy and her, her interest in art, her private art collection, uh, her influence on the arts. And so this intrigues me, and that's why I got this photograph. If you notice, there are three uh, Catlin paintings uh, placed right outside her chamber door here. <clears throat> and <clears throat> I've been unable to determine, and I have tried, whether or not Jackie Kennedy acquired these uh, Catlin paintings on loan from the Smithsonian, or if they were there prior to her stay at the White House. No one seems, I haven't been able to determine that. But my guess is it had something to do with Jackie Kennedy, because if you look at this photograph and you see this kind of design of the space, you know, these paintings, these sensitive paintings of Native Americans, the Kennedys were very big on civil rights. And I'm going to talk about talk about that a little more later on but notice underneath the paintings we have two i think are ming dynasty vases and two i believe are federalist 
uh, tables. And this is exactly out of Jackie Kennedy's design vocabulary. And I have a feeling that she set up this little uh, environment as a as kind of a peaceful space, a peaceful entrance uh, for herself. But that's just my theory on that. So I'm going to jump here to 1899. Buffalo Bill's Wild West show uh, comes to New York. And um, Buffalo Bill had, after the Indian Wars, had uh, gotten the, many of the, the Sioux uh, chief, chieftains and braves and families to join his uh, basically circus. And um, you know, if, you, if on Cody on, on record felt he was doing something humanitarian, he was giving them money, a livelihood. He was taking them overseas to tour Europe, et cetera, et cetera. But, uh, which may or may not be true, but they were still, they were still uh, being forced to make a living as circus performers, uh, which I don't think they could have been com completely thrilled about. But anyhow, in 1899, a parade promoting Buffalo Bill's Wild West show is going down Fifth Avenue, and this woman, Gertrude Casabier, uh, a portrait photographer from this period, New York portrait photographer from this period, who was uh, kind of on par with, with, with Edward Steiglitz. They both had their studios in the same building on Fifth Avenue. She hears this parade, goes to, looks out her window, and is thrilled to see all these Native Americans in full, you know, their full uh, gear, everything, parading right past her studio window. She had grown up in, I believe, Colorado and uh, during the gold rush. And she had a, a lot of direct exposure to the Native Americans in her area as a little girl. She was always fascinated by their culture, by their, by, by their whole, uh, by, by the whole uh, phenomenon. And uh, she makes it, she decides at that point that she's going to photograph uh, Members of these of, of Wild Bill's uh, uh, Wild West show, Buffalo Bill's Wild West show, and and do their portraits. So in 1899, she does what are considered the first real official portraits of Native Americans. Again, moving us away from the popular culture uh, narrative of Native Americans and showing a much more personal, humanistic uh, portrayal of them. So it's a young, brave Joe Black Fox. Uh, now, just take note here. Notice he's wearing a uh, so-called tin star, which is part of his costume, part of his character for the Wild West show to remind us that he still is essentially a performer in a circus. But you can see the dignity in these portraits, which is what I want to uh, uh, stress, just like you could see dignity in Catlin's uh, portraits. Here's another one of this young woman, uh, Jessica Crabtree. Um, and uh, these uh, photographs were first published in Joseph Steiglitz's photo photography magazine, I think in 1901. And they immediately got attention. And they also, like Catlin's work, were eventually purchased by the Smithsonian Institute, where they are today. And again, this entire body of work is available through the Smithsonian Institute. Another one is pretty amazing is Chief, uh, this portrait of Chief Flying Hawk, who had uh, been president at, at Custer's uh, last stand, who had fought against Custer. And um, now again, he's reduced to being a circus performer. What's interesting, I have just this little side note on, on uh, Flying Hawk. He, uh, of all these Indian chiefs in the, uh, that I, I don't know of another uh, uh, chief from that group that was interested uh, in education as Flying Hawk was. Uh, throughout his uh, life or during this period, he stressed education for young Native Americans, thought it was their best hope to have a good life, which was very unusual at the time. And he also would actually go as far as speaking in, in public schools. Uh, stressing education, education, education. So very unusual, very unusual man.
And one more of these I wanted to get in was Chief Iron Tail. Wonderful, wonderful, uh, dignified uh, portrait here. He uh, refused to put on his his headdress, his traditional headdress they wore in the in the circus, and his full costume. He wouldn't do it, and he would only appear in his normal everyday clothing. And uh, I think this he's really trying to make a statement here to see him as a as a full person and not just a pers uh, a performer or uh, extend any kind of stereotypes. And um, it's a beautiful portrait. And Iron Tail may look slightly familiar to you, and that's because his profile was used for the like, so-called Indian nickel. That's Iron Tail. So again, jumping up here to the 1940s, the popular culture uh, narrative of Native Americans is still of the kind of uh, noble savage. We see from this now, dime stories have progressed to what we refer to as pulp magazines. Still hugely popular, still primarily produced and published uh, on the East Coast, using exclusively East Coast artists, many who were trained at Pratt Institute, by the way, as commercial artists. And I forgot to mention with uh, Gertrude Casabier that she was one of the first uh, women uh, students at Pratt Institute, which at the time I think was one of the only uh, colleges that uh, or universities that allowed women to fully participate in all programs. So just a footnote on that. But we see here with this cover how the ultimate uh, racial stereotype is being used. Uh, you know, the the uh, dark skinned man or whatever attacking the white woman. So you have these two different kind of narratives uh, going on uh, in America about Native Americans and the American West. Now here in 1960, this is where things really change, really shift. Um, this is a photo, a postcard <clears throat> from the uh, what was the post office in downtown Santa Fe, New Mexico. In 1963, a charter is presented to uh, John F. Kennedy <clears throat> uh, for his consideration to start a, an art school uh, exclusively for young Native American artists. Uh, and they were going to take this post office and transform it into an art school. And uh, Kennedy, I, I'm guessing much with the guidance of Jackie Kennedy, uh, signs the charter and changes uh, Western art forever in America. So in 1963, we have the start of the brand new, one in a kind Institute of uh, uh, American Indian Arts in New Mexico. And by the way, this building is still there. If you go to Santa Fe, it's part of a, a, a Native American museum now. Uh, and it's still there, a wonderful, wonderful place. Uh, if you get it, if, yeah, it's just a fantastic place, very exciting. Um, so, in 1963-64, the first young Native American artists uh, start attending the uh, IAIA. This is one of those artists. His name was T.C. Cannon. And these something different about these young Native American artists is that they've been influenced by the uh, Cultural Revolution of the 1960s. So these... These guys, mostly guys, I have to say, in context of the times, I don't know of any women who were enrolled in that original class. Uh, if there were, there were very few. But these young men were uh, into Bob Dylan. You know, everything that was going on in the 60s, they were into it, um, as well as their own Native uh, culture and history. So for the first time, these young Native American artists would have the opportunity to kind of merge these two narratives into a new narrative. So in the mid 1960s, this is a painting by T.C. Cannon, very famous, called Waiting for a Bus. Startling painting at the time, com something completely new in Native American art and Western art. Uh, that um, Cannon here is focusing on real people, 
that he sees in everyday life uh, on the reservation or in the towns near the reservation. This is something totally new in Native American art in America. And uh, you can see the influences of 1960s New York artists, uh, most specifically here, uh, uh, Jasper Johns. And also you'll see a lot of influence by uh, uh, Robert Rauschenberg. By the way, this painting was on uh, exhibit uh, downtown in the American Indian Museum, um, I think it was 2019. And uh, I, I, it was a whole show on T.C. Cannon, which was just amazing. That's the first time I found out about his work. And this painting in the spirit of the uh, post-abstract expressionist is very large. It's like seven feet tall, seven by four or something like that. Another painting by T.C. Cannon, who, Consistently, even though he's showing his people who are living in very reduced conditions on reservations, he always manages to show their, their dignity and their pride. Um, here's another, uh, one of the last paintings he did of an elderly woman, Abba, at, at, on a reservation. Um, unfortunately, I think this was done in... Um, this was done in 1978, this painting. And unfortunately, Cannon would uh, die later that year in a car accident, at, I think age 39. Uh, real tragedy. He was just becoming so popular that he was going to have his first one-person show, major one-person show in a, in, a, in, a, in a New York gallery. And unfortunately, he, uh, he was killed uh, before he was able to uh, have the show. So by 1968, <clears throat> um, the civil rights movement in America is in full swing and Native Americans are very much part of that civil rights movement. Uh, I think it was 1968 when AIM uh, was founded. I think it started in Minnesota. And uh, this is a photograph of Russell Means on the left, who was a leader, one of the leaders of AIM. And uh, of course, we all know about the the, you know, their, their standoff in Wounded Knee, uh, South Dakota, where they made, uh, they were fighting for civil rights, their own rights. And they were um, assaulted, I believe, by FBI at the time. And it was an armed, uh, you know, armed engagement. And uh, I think a couple of the, the Native, Amer a couple of Native Americans, at least two were, were killed. Met several, at least a dozen were wounded. And it was a pivotal, pivotal point for uh, Native American civil rights. So this, this is all happening at once. Around this time, another painter, actually the painting instructor from the IAIA, his name was Fritz Shoulder, he was a quarter uh, Native American blood, was started doing this series in the early 19, late 1960s, uh, early 1970s called Real Indians. And these paintings were shocking when they were when they came out uh, and were first shown on the West Coast, I believe, in Los Angeles. Um, this is a uh, these were a combination, an odd combination of Francis Bacon, a painter that Shoulder admired, and Peter Max. So they have this pop quality with very intense subject matter. This is a part of a series called Insane Indians or Insane Braves, I think, like 39th in the series, something like that. And these are enormous paintings done in pop acrylic paints. Um, and they were immediately successful in, within the art world. And Fritz Scholder would go on to become the most successful uh, out, of all, out of all the Native American artists coming out of the IAIA. He's still regarded as an important um, figure uh, to young artists, young Native American artists. Here's another one of these amazing paintings from this period by Shoulder, where he's daring to uh, show uh, Native Americans uh, in very shocking circumstances, I'll say. This is the painting of a, of a Native American male hanging out in a bus station at an arcade. Uh, Obviously, you know, the, the implication he's unemployed, possibly alcoholic. And 
Shoulder is daring to show this uh, depressing aspect of life on the res, so to speak, for the first time. Uh, well, Cannon had done it as well. That's a whole other story. I don't have time to go into today. But uh, although these paintings were hugely successful and sold for, for big dollars, his own people, the people on the res, didn't like him. And he got a tremendous flack and hostility for doing these paintings. Uh, one more of these. Uh, I think this is called Walking to the Next Bar. So you can see what he's doing here, which had never, again, no one had dared paint this before or depict this reality that Native American men were, were going through. Um, here's just a, a, a photograph of the, uh, taken at the Gagosian Go Go Gallery in Los Angeles, uh, I think in the early 2000s, um, just to give you a sense of the scale of these paintings and how powerful they are. One more of these is called Saturday uh, Matinee Idol. Uh, and uh, Shoulder, as a, as a, as a boy, uh, he had been raised to deny his heritage. He was, uh, grew up in a time where many Native Americans were ashamed of their background and were encouraged not to speak their native tongue uh, or exhibit any of the uh, outward traits of, uh, of their people. And uh, one of the things that Shoulder loved, like most kids from uh, the 1950, uh, 1940s, was going to Saturday matinee serials. And he was a big fan of the Westerns. And Shoulder actually identified more with the cowboys, the white uh, heroes, than the Native American characters in the serials. And he admits this. Um, and it took him till middle life to start embracing his own heritage and start expressing it through his paintings. So this is a character. Uh, this was a, a movie cowboy hero from these serials that Shoulder loved. His name was Monty Hale. And one of the, the fondest memories Shoulder had was as a, as a young boy waiting in line at one of these matinees on Saturday and getting to see Monty Hale in person and getting his autograph, just to show the power of popular culture and how even Native Americans were you know, having identity issues uh, at this point in time. So I'm going to jump again now to the 1980s in New York. Yeah. And uh, there's a, uh, an artist, um, Richard Prince, who attempts to take up the theme, the mythology of the American cowboy, the noble cowboy again, and bring it into the fine art world of the 1980s New York art scene. Uh, this is one of these, what he called uh, re-photographs of a uh, of a cowboy. He would have, well, let me go into this a little bit. This is a photograph of Richard Prince. Uh, Richard Prince was working as a, a some kind of assistant, low-level assistant at one of the ad, large ad agencies in New York who handled the Marlboro cigarette ca ad campaign. And uh, they featured these cowboys, photographs of cow cowboys. Amazing, beautiful photographs. And um, he worked in the production area where they were taking proof sheets, images, you know, reproductions of these photographs that were getting ready to be printed in magazines or tear sheets, I believe they were called. And um, they were being thrown into the garbage 